The illustrations, the note are not like anything else you've ever seen in a magical grimoire. They're not like sigils, they're not like talismans, they're not like protective circles. They are quite completely unique. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the esoteric podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Eth, and today we are diving deep into the Ars Notoria with internationally acclaimed author, practicing magician, and scholar, Dr. Stephen Skinner. Listeners, before we dive into anything and everything related to the Ars Notoria, I would definitely encourage you to check out Dr. Skinner's previous appearances on the podcast if you haven't already. He's written dozens and dozens of books translated into more than 20 different languages. He received his PhD in classics from the University of Newcastle for his research on the Greek text of the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri and a number of Latin grimoires. And in this episode, Dr. Skinner shares about the Ars Notoria, the Grimoire of Rapid Learning by Magic, which he released with Daniel Clark. Now, I know so many listeners are familiar with the Ars Notoria. The Ars Notoria itself gives extensive prayers and orations to be recited while contemplating detailed images, a nota or note. The practical goal by monks and others in the Middle Ages was to use the Ars Notoria to rapidly acquire information related to grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, the so-called seven classical liberal arts. And this new presentation of the Ars Notoria by Dr. Skinner and Daniel Clark is the first time an English text oriented to practitioners has ever been published along with manuscript images of full sets of note. The Ars Notoria stands alone in its own category of angel grimoires because while most other Solomonic grimoires are concerned with the evocation of spirits or demons, the Ars Notoria instead was concerned only with memory and the ability to understand and absorb whole subjects rapidly, making it a veritable student's grimoire and a key to obtaining knowledge rapidly. And Dr. Skinner and Daniel Clark in this edition present not just one, but five complete sets of note taken from various manuscripts alongside a corrected edition of Robert Turner's English translation of the Ars Notoria, first done in 1657. So Dr. Skinner is taking the time today to share all about the Ars Notoria, how it is not part of the Lamegaton, the relationship between the Ars Notoria and the sworn book of Honorius, the fascinating origins of some of the beautiful Beautiful note illustrations. Also, Dr. Skinner is answering your Patreon listener questions and so, so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, I give you Dr. Stephen Skinner. Dr. Stephen Skinner, thank you so much for stopping by the Glitch Bottle podcast again. Oh, my pleasure to be chatting with you again. Can you just share with us, Dr. Skinner, what was the main driving force for yourself and, and Daniel Clark to present this edition of the Ars Notoria? Well, I've been thinking about the Ars Notoria for a long time. When I was a kid, I thought, oh, it must be the notorious art, which, of course, it's not. Notario refers to the notes, the note, the, the illustrations. But as a kid, I was fascinated by the idea I could actually do this and absorb an entire subject in a matter of a month or something. And so it's been sort of hanging around at the back of my head. And finally, talking to Daniel, who has been absolutely an essential part of this operation, he did a lot of the legwork in finding the, the manuscripts. We documented 110 manuscripts. There's probably another 50 or so in libraries, but they are sort of hidden in plain sight. Why? Because at first glance, the text, if you don't have the, the note, just looks like a series of prayers. So librarians typically catalog them as, as a book of prayers and didn't bother with the title. So Daniel's been uh, instrumental in winkling out these and organizing copies from the various libraries, which is no small thing. 
when we'd got it lined up like that, we just had to do it. You mentioned, Dr. Skinner, to that point in the book as well with Daniel Clark, that so many people might be familiar with Robert Turner's 1657 translation of the Latin text into English. And you mentioned that one of the big problems with that text is that it's so comprehensive in terms of what it translates. However, it does not include the note. And you had this analogy about it's like sitting in a very nice car, but without an engine and nowhere to go. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, I think I should backtrack a bit to say exactly what is the method? How does this work? The idea was that you, you said a basic prayer, which is to the appropriate angel, and then you read out a series of magical words, which we can talk about later. And at the same time, you contemplate these rather beautiful but intricate diagrams. And however you want to cut it, you know, maybe you go into trance, maybe the entities listed there come and help you. But in theory, then this information percolates into your head. Now, the book says that you must continue to read the textbooks of the subject. So if you're doing geometry, you continue to read those. But it makes absorption of the subject that, that much faster. It doesn't work like magic in the sense you can't sit down and say, I want to know everything about astronomy, including things that haven't been found yet, but I'm not going to do any work and nothing would happen. But you continue to look through existing textbooks of astronomy and the absorption rate is much greater. And we can talk a bit later about some practical experiments I've done with this. So I was intrigued. It's not like any other book of magic. Other books of magic involve actually invoking, sometimes to physical manifestation, a demon, a spirit, or an angel. This one, this is not necessarily part of it. So it was fascinating. Can you kind of talk about that this is effectively a four-month operation, and one would, in, in the last month where things intensify, one would look at or gaze at or consider the note in front of them for that specific subject or goal while reciting various prayers and orations. Can you kind of elaborate on that? The illustrations, the note, are not like anything else you've ever seen in a magical grimoire. They're not like sigils, they're not like talismans, they're not like protective circles. They're quite completely unique. I haven't found very many parallels outside of this particular text. And this was something that for a long time was mainly used inside the monastic community. As Sophie Page has pointed out, monks, of, uh, particularly of certain monasteries, were hard at experimenting with magic. And I imagine this is probably one of their favorite texts because uh, to be able to memorize things and, and retain them and develop understanding of something you knew nothing about three months ago in just four months' work is truly amazing. As I said, that is why I was initially interested as a child. I thought, wow, this would abbreviate all the work I have to do at school. <laughs> of course, um, I didn't get it working at that stage. So that's really it. But the illustrations, the oldest ones we've got were drawn in 1225. It's actually in a very small but very beautifully drawn book, which is presently in Yale University. A lot of the, the manuscripts that we found were actually in, in England, some of the more interesting ones in France. Amongst the Central European libraries, there were copies of the Ars Notoria, but um, none of them had these notate. Without the note, it's, it's going back to it was actually Daniel's suggestion. It's like sitting in a nice car with no engine because it doesn't work. Just praying is not sufficient. Dr. Skinner, can you share with the listeners about the subject matters? This was the kind of seven classical liberal arts. Yeah, you probably don't want to get me started on this, but... In the Middle Ages, there was a, a very set curriculum. I mean, nowadays in school, there are subjects like, I don't know, geography, uh, social studies, whatever else. But throughout most of the Middle Ages, there was a fixed curriculum. And it consisted of three introductory subjects, which, because it was in Latin, was called the trivium, meaning three. But trivium, of course, is the word from which is derived the word trivial. Uh, these were not trivial, these are quite hard work, 
and then they were followed by the quadrivium, which is four subjects. But it's a little bit more interesting because the trivium were all word-based subjects, quadrivium were all number-based subjects, and then the postgraduate stuff was the, the more practical subjects like medicine or law or even magic. But let's look at them in detail. The trivium consisted of three things, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. Now, that sounds boring. I think most schools now have given up teaching grammar. But in fact, the idea of learning grammar is that you can assemble your thoughts into words, into sentences, into good writing with ease. The second one, dialectic, is logic. So it gave you the ability to think logically and to argue. And then the third one was rhetoric, which was the, the ability to speak convincingly and deliver those arguments. So I think that these three subjects, which are now completely lost out of the curriculum, really should become part of even the basic school curriculum again, because people do not anymore speak or write clearly, logically. Discussion now is, is quite often not the trading of logical argument one to another, but more like, as somebody said, shouting past each other. And rhetoric, the ability to convince somebody else that your point of view is right, could be quite useful. Anyway, so that was the, the trivium. Of course, in those days, learning grammar meant that you learned the, the grammar of Latin, which is more complicated, and I can, I can tell you for sure, more complicated than the grammar of English. And uh, logic and dialectic is still taught at university level. And rhetoric, nobody actually teaches rhetoric these days. But it would be good for people to learn how to express their thoughts a little bit more clearly. Okay, so that's my rave about the trivium. The next block of subjects is the quadrivium. These are all number-based. So logically, it includes arithmetic, geometry, and then, strangely, astronomy, which when you think about it, is really complicated geometry in the skies, tracking position of planets, position of stars, etc. And then finally music. That's a weird one, but music in the Middle Ages was very much arithmetically based ratios between certain notes and things. I'm not very musically inclined, but I can see how that could easily be a numeric subject. So those four would give you the ability to manipulate numbers. And then the postgraduate subjects, uh, I don't think they were called postgraduate, but you moved into a higher school, was medicine, theology. And nowadays, very few people do theology. But in those days, it was considered, uh, when Christianity was much stronger than it is now in the modern world, theology was considered important. Law. And then finally, nigromancy or magic, was a subject almost at the same sort of level. I can tell you for sure it's every bit as complicated as medicine or theology, but people nowadays wouldn't agree with that. That was the subjects, and the objective of Ars Notoria was to make each of these easy to absorb. So you could spend three months, four months, learning all Latin grammar, the same period learning all geometry or all arithmetic or even all medicine. So let's say the year is 1300, I'm a monk, I want to use the Ars Notoria to help improve grammar, to help improve Latin. So can you kind of walk us through this four-month process where before I even start to seek out the actual note of grammar, before I start to recite the specific prayers and orations, this whole process starts with petitioning or seeking, I guess, approval would be a good word, to go forward from an angel. Can you just talk about this kind of initial approval that's needed before you can move forward? Yes, just as when you're starting a university course, you would seek approval, you pass the entry exams or whatever. So there's a preparatory period where you cleanse yourself of sins by confession and fasting and then you do certain very physical things to see if the angels approve of you learning this subject. So on the first Friday, you take a, a selection of leaves, wash them in saffron and rose water, 
and then on each of the four leaves you write the name of the one of the angels you put them on your altar and then you do a strange thing you wash the ink off into fresh water and whilst reciting the appropriate uh, invocations and things you swallow it now I thought this is really weird but because I'm living in Asia and talking to some of the the Taoist magicians here I remembered that what they do is they draw talismans and they put on it the signature of the spirit that they want to deal with they wash the ink off into water and they drink it and that's used also for cure of various diseases so although it's weird it appears to be a fairly universal practice so after drinking the angel name water and you recite the appropriate invocations then you have to read certain chapters out of the Ars Notoria out loud or, or quietly to yourself at certain times of the day now later we look at the the question as to whether this belongs to Solomonic magic or to astral magic and this part of it choosing particular hours to read these things ties in with both of those uh, styles of magic and then on the Saturday you follow the same procedure use different prayers during this time you are fasting just as you would for most Solomonic magic operations and then again on Sunday and at the end of this time uh, not just because you're fasting you're likely to have a very clear dream and the dream will either show you approval to move forward or it will tell you why you cannot and I do believe that not everybody should get involved in magic magic is quite a demanding practice whether it's ours notoria or evocation and here you have a sort of entry point where you are told fairly clearly whether you should or not now from the few bits of practical I've done on this you do get the dream whether the dream is positive or negative we won't go into but you do get the dream and then after that you have three months where you've got a sort of set of practices and during those three months you're supposed to read everything you can lay your hands on relating to the subject you're trying to learn but you don't read it in the way that you would if you're cramming at school or cramming for an exam or cramming at university you read it with a relaxed brain if that makes any sense and you allow it to store itself in your head you don't do reread write out summarize or any of the usual techniques that that are advised for learning and then in the fourth month then you're allowed to actually look at the note which you should not have looked at before then and again you inspect them with a relaxed brain you don't read them you don't scrutinize them you just look at them and enjoy the bizarre shapes and the the words and things in it at which time you will have finished the operation and you should have absorbed a lot much larger chunk of the subject than you would have otherwise done if you were just doing your ordinary preparation for an exam or something now you don't have to take my word for that because indeed you can try it for yourself what do we know dr skinner about not only where this came from but perhaps who might have first put quill to parchment so to speak and and actually wrote this down well i suspect that the first guys put quill to papyrus rather than parchment the traditional author is supposed to have been apollonius of tyana who is definitely a real character he's not a fictional character he lived around about the same time as jesus christ and did a lot of the miracles that christ also did and um, traveled from Europe to India and back again spent a lot of time in Egypt a lot of time in Syria he was born in Syria he's quite a fascinating figure there is a, a Latin biography of him which is probably a little bit exaggerated but it's an amazing read of course the, the ultimate author is reputed to be Solomon Solomon is supposed to have been given this text by an angel we can sort of gloss over that and look at the the more real people involved in it i mean solomon was obviously real but this is something you cannot prove so apart from apollonius there was input into this book from euclid 
I don't mean Euclid the, the geometer, and I don't mean Euclid of Megara. Uh, I mean Euclid of Thebes in Greece. He is also a real character. He'll come back into the conversation a little bit later when we talk about other grimoires with similar uh, content. So these two were magicians. These are the claimed authors. I won't do what Mathers did when he was talking about the Key of Solomon and, and aver that, oh, it must have been written by King Solomon because it says so on the title page. The title pages on all of these quite often have fictional authors. In today's world, it, is, it would be unbelievable for an author not to put his own name and to put the name of somebody more famous than him. But in the past, that was the way of doing it. So Euclid of Thebes may or may not have had a hand in writing it. Apollonius of Tyana, I think, is quite a possible input because there's a lot of uh, recorded history about him producing large statues and massive talismans for cities and things. So he was obviously into conjuration with images. But now, if we think, where did it come from? There's a couple of temptations here. It's tempting to say that it came from Jewish origins, because there was a Jewish angel called, uh, was it Sartora? Yes, uh, Sarhatora, I think. Yeah, who supposedly helped the rabbis learn vast swatches of biblical text and commentaries and make it easy for them to learn. So this is the same concept, to have an angel to help you absorb this material. So Jewish origins are a possibility, but I found concrete evidence that the intermediate origin, at least, is Greek. Now, those of you who know my work are probably going to say, well, of course he would say that because he's always been interested in the Greco-Egyptian papyri, etc., and so, yes, I, I admit to a certain bias towards Greece or uh, Greek culture as the origin, but it's quite possible that the material came from a Jewish background and was filtered through Greek magical books into Ars Notoria as we know it. But the thing that really clinched it for me was I was looking at two of the, the note. These are, I think it's the seventh note of philosophy, and they're really strange. What they show is there's two of them, and they're very similar, two columns sitting on top of an inverted Medusa head. Medusa head's got wild hair. Now, who plants columns on top of upturned marble heads? And I remembered when I was in Constantinople, sorry, I should be saying uh, Istanbul, but my head is probably more comfortable in the uh, 6th century than it is today, going into one of the, the huge water storage systems underneath the city. This particular one, which is called the Basilica, simply because of its sheer size, is supposed to be able to, to hold 100,000 tons of water, which is pretty amazing. It was built by Justinian in the 6th century, and so, of course, I wanted to have a look at it, so I went down there, and, of course, there's not 100,000 tons of water in there anymore, but there's, there's quite a bit of water. And so I was wandering about, looking at the columns and wondering where they came from. And, indeed, what Justinian did was, instead of carving 360, I think it was 360 columns, and paying for that and so forth, he simply went out and stole the columns from ancient Greek temples, because, as a Christian, he had no respect for the, the previous religion. So he, to use his word, harvested columns from previous temples. Complete disrespect for them. The Christian practice in those days, actually, which is very insulting, was to leave three columns standing, representative of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and just take every, all the other columns. So this is why, if you're wandering around Greece, you'll frequently see temples where just three columns are left, and you wonder, what happened? Was it an earthquake? Did everything fall over except those three? And the answer is no. Justinian happened, and he took them all back to Constantinople. So while I was wandering around in this huge water system, thinking how sad it was that many of these beautiful columns were no longer where they should be, 
I came across two massive columns standing on huge inverted heads of Medusa. And I think, I can't remember, they're about, each head is about 12 foot tall and it's very solid and you can see the, the snakes carved in the hair. Now, who would do that? Well, of course, Justinian probably wanted to insult Medusa and uh, pin Medusa down with the columns. But whatever his reason... There's probably the only place in the whole world where you see this column on an inverted Medusa head. And then it hit me. Yes, of course, one of the note in, in Ars Notoria, or in two of them, in fact, was exactly these columns. So I can say, without any fear of contradiction, that if it wasn't actually written in Constantinople, that at least one of the editors or one of the scribes who generated the note must have lived there because this is not something you find anywhere else. You go to Switzerland or Timbuktu or Africa, nobody has got a column like that. So I can say that the immediate source of the, of the Ars Notoria was Greek culture, Greek culture specifically in Constantinople. Now, what it was before that, I suspect it was probably a Greek culture in Egypt, but I can't prove that. But, of course, the Greco-Egyptian papyri do include a number of Hebrew god names and angel names. So it would not be surprising that some of those angel names had also crept into the Ars Notoria. And so whether the, the Sar Hatora is from the same source or whether it is the source, I don't know. I can't say. So I can only go back to Constantinople and hope that I can find the links to take the history of Ars Notoria back further. Thank you for the elucidation, Dr. Skinner. In fact, I, I think that they answered the, the question from listener Mark Edward Hendricks, who was asking that a lot of that early uh, Jewish mystical Hecalot literature deals with that same result of rapid learning via the angel. And what you're saying is that perhaps if it did, you know, influence uh, things, especially in Alexandria, where you have Jewish, Arabic, Greek, Egyptian, kind of all marinating together, that filtered through that kind of Greek uh whoever it was who put the initial seventh nota of philosophy together shows a clear Greek influence. Yeah, a clear Constantinople influence, indeed. The earliest um, Ars Notoria that, that we have in terms of, uh, you know, complete is from 1225. So do we have any evidence of, of any other uh, fragments or anything before 1225? Or is, is that kind nope. of the furthest uh, back? That is absolutely the beginning as far as we know at the moment. And I was surprised. I thought, oh, there must be fragments somewhere. Things like this don't just arrive fully formed because this is this is very detailed. There's a large number of note there. Well, we've got to look at them to see how detailed they are. And so Daniel and I went back and checked, as I was saying, about 110 Manuscripts. We couldn't always get to the libraries, but we, in many cases, got copies, etc., etc. Nothing goes back before 1225. At least, if it does, we didn't find it. Hopefully, somebody will, but there must be a history prior to that. I, I think probably the next job is to look in some of the old monastic libraries in Turkey. As you mentioned, Dr. Skinner, the Ars Notoria does not fall comfortably into either of the categories of astral or image magic, like the Picatrix, or into Solomonic magic, which involves, of course, you know, the invocation and evocation of, of spiritual creatures. So can you share with the listeners about that we're left with a totally unique style of magic? Can you elaborate on this? Well, first of all, there must be some listeners out there who are jumping up and down and saying, well, Ars Notoria is part of the Megaton, so therefore, blah, blah, blah. So I think I should just slaughter that sacred cow before we go any further. The Ars Notoria was not part of the Megaton before about 1641, when it was incorporated into manuscript of the, the Megaton. Before that, it was a completely separate work for the previous 400 years back to 1225. had nothing to do with the Megaton. So it's just a sort of artifact of the way the manuscripts have been put together, and it's been perpetuated. Uh, when Joseph Peterson did the 
did his text of the Megaton. He included the Ars Notoria at the back. But I can tell you, apart from manuscript proof, you can see for yourself from the actual method in each case that there's no connection at all. The first four books of the the Megaton, the Goetia, the Theurgia Goetia, the Pauline Art One, Pauline Art Two, and the Almadel, these all involve evoking spiritual creatures, be they demons, spirits, or angels. Uh, in the case of the Goetia, quite often into visible appearance, and also the the Almadel. This it's quite a strict regime. You, you need protection in the form of a, a magic circle to stand on. You need a phylactery on your chest. You need to go through purification rituals. So you need to fast and you need to pray beforehand. All of this is for your benefit and protection. And then the actual operation needs to be done at a certain time, etc., etc. The Arsenatoria, apart from fasting, has none of that. And there's no question of evoking to physical appearance or otherwise a demon or an angel. It's a much more religious approach where you're actually praying to the angels. The bit, of course, which is not religious is the list of magical names, which is part of the procedure. And these are probably partially angelic, partly demonic but they're not specifically being invoked. They're being read out like a a long roll call with perhaps the implication of you guys please come and help me learn this subject but it's not specifically specified Arsentoria is almost out there by itself and then the other main uh, western magical school if you like is the astral image talismanic school which derives almost entirely from the Picatrix which was translated in the early 1200s about the same time actually but in Spain, under the aegis of Alfonso X, I think, this relies upon complicated astrological calculations to make sure that the influences from the stars, from the planets, even from the fixed stars, are available from the night sky at the time you are producing the talisman. And then the talisman has certain images on it, certain words on it, and things will be said at the same time. Now, one of the fascinating things about the Internet, one of the things that makes you all so lucky to be studying magic at this time, is that there's one or two specialist groups which have just concentrating on this. Warnock is, is in one of them. And these guys are actually delineating the results they're getting, and whether it worked, whether it didn't work, why it worked, why it didn't work. They are applying the scientific method to talisman manufacture. Andy Foster is is another great exponent in that area. But this is quite different again. This is not evoking spirits. This is just doing talismans at specific times, consecrating them, and then leaving them to do their work. So the two main schools, Solomonic, evocatory magic, talismanic, astrological, uh, astral magic, I like to call it astral magic. And there's a lot of material in both of these schools. And as I say, the astral magic is just coming to the fore again, having been sort of almost ignored for the last two or three hundred years. But Ars Notoria is out there with a little bit of one and a little bit of the other, but it's not using talismans, it's not using tools, it doesn't have consecrated swords, it doesn't have circles to stand on. So it's a unique method. And until somebody makes the connection from Constantinople back to either Palestine or Egypt or Syria. I think Syria is quite a possible candidate because, of course, that's where Apollonius of Tyana came from. Until that connection is made, we can't really say much about it. What we can say about it is how it relates to the sworn book of Honorius in as much as 74 of the prayers are the same. These two grimoires appeared at the same time. So it's possible that Arsenatoria and the Sworn Book of Anarius, the first section only, came from the same source, and that, that provides a third group of magical methods. The, the second half of the Sworn Book of Anarius is a, a straightforward Solomonic grimoire, and I'm sure it came from a different origin. Now, 
the clincher with regards to the Arsenatoria not being part of the Megaton is actually found in the Arsenatoria itself. And there's a, a Latin passage in there, which I'm going to ask Alex if he would like to read for us. Absolutely, Dr. Skinner. The passage on page 345 of the book reads one of the last sentences in paragraph 20b that says in Latin, Shendum est etiam artem notoriam et omnes artes et omnem literatam scientiam mirabiliter contere que testante Salamone, idio est ars notoria, quia qui bustam notulus, breuissimis omnium comprehensibiliter scriptorum, e docet cognitionem, sicut etiam, et Salomon in tractu le megaton, hoc est in tractu spiritualium, et secretorum experimentorum. Excellent. I just wanted to get a nice piece of ecclesiastical Latin into your broadcast, and you've done an excellent job on that, probably better than I could do. But the key is, what does it mean? So, translation, this is actually, I'm going from Turner's translation, which is pretty good. Therefore, the book is called The Notary Art, because in certain brief notes, it teaches and comprehendeth the knowledge of all arts. For so Solomon also saith in his treatise Le Megaton, that is, in his treatise of spiritual and secret experiments. Now, for Solomon also saith in his treatise Le Megaton is very clearly referring to the Megaton in the third person as a separate book. So, he's quoting the Le Megaton, but he's not saying this book we are reading is part of it. So the Le Megaton is interesting, describes a treatise of spiritual and secret experiments, which is a description I haven't seen elsewhere. I take that to indicate very clearly that it's only the happenstance of people binding manuscripts together that ever brought the Arsentoria into the Le Megaton. Dr. Skinner, while we are on the subject of the Lamegaton, Frater Ashen Shassan does have a question about, you know, does Dr. Skinner have any theories about how and why the notary arts were included as the final book in the Lamegaton? What's the relationship? I wish I had an answer to that. I, in fact, I wish I had an answer to exactly what the, the person who did it meant by Lamegaton. It's obviously a Greek word, but not a very obvious one. I think it was put together probably around about 1641. Whoever put it together obviously did the right thing in grabbing four Solomonic texts. Why they also grabbed the Ars Notoria, I can't tell. I hope at one stage to go and actually physically look at these texts and see if there's any clues as to why. But working from digital copies, it's not possible to say. One of the things you mentioned, Dr. Skinner, again, just to button up the Lamegaton topic, is you say that, quote, one of the strangest ideas that has popped up recently is that the Ars Notoria should be treated as some kind of prologue to the four books of the Lamegaton. This is complete nonsense and obviously invented by someone who has no idea what it is or how it works. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Well, the main and true books of the Lamegaton are all Solomonic demon or spirit evocations, that's clear. They're all similar. One is uh, evocation of the angels of the four chorus. Another one is the evocation of, of particular decans, angels of decans. The Goetia is evocation of 72 spirits. These are all what the Taoist magicians call spirit registers. For Taoist, though I'm talking Chinese Taoist, magicians, it is key to have a clear list of the spirits that you can and should evoke. These are all of the same sort of material. And then along comes something to teach you how to do geometry, arithmetic, medicine, grammar, and rhetoric is obviously completely different. The style of the Latin is different, the, the subject matter is different, the techniques are different. So, it is not part. And then the idea that you should prepare for goetic evocations by learning grammar, rhetoric, dialectic, just doesn't make any sense, does it? Just to quote on page 215 of the book, 
I think there might be some confusion from some people who read that, and I'd love to get your elaborations on this, because when it comes to the Ars Nova, you and Daniel say specifically, this is the third part called Artem Novam, which simply means a new art. It is not related to the Ars Nova in the Lamegaton. This part is noticeably different from the Flores Aure, having longer prayers and maybe a simpler system. So can you just elaborate in terms of the Ars Nova and the Lamegaton sure. versus this? Okay. Well, the Latin Ars Nova simply means new art. So you see in many subjects there will be, oh, you know, we've revised this, and so the new art is this or that. So there are many books called Ars Nova, so there's an invitation for confusion uh, right up front. The Ars Nova in in the Lamegaton is also confused because people starting with matters have been reading the pages across lines whereas in fact the text is two columns you've got to read it down the first one and down the second so the way matters and indeed everybody else after him copied it makes no sense it's like a series of, of definitions whereas in fact it's really just a Kabbalistic summary and then short form prayers which is very clear. This I have explained a long time ago in the Goetia of Dr. Rudd. So in one of the many appendices in there is a transcription of this in the right order. And then it makes perfectly good sense. So that's the Ars Nova. So we are referring to several different things when we say Ars Nova. So if I look at the contents page for the Ars Notoria, the whole book starts with a prologue which is only a couple of pages long. And then there's the the golden flowers of Apollonius of Tyana. And I believe these bits were sort of probably assembled together at some stage. And that's followed by a section of the liberal arts. So first of all, there's the trivium, as we've already discussed, then the quadrivium. And then after that is the Ars Nova, which has got ten prayers in it. Nothing more, just ten, or as this book says, ten orations. And then after that, there's a supplementary gloss and more prayers. And then the fifth section is on the figure of memory. Now, poor old Turner was working from a defective Latin copy. And so one of the things that make Turner's translation a bit scrambled is that these are mixed up. So Daniel and I went through and working with the Latin and working with other manuscripts, we put it in order. So now that the order is prologue, Golden Flowers, Trivium, Quadrivium, Ars Nova, Supplementary Gloss and Prayers and Figure of Memory. There's nothing special about Ars Nova. It's just obviously a little bit later than the, the Golden Flowers, and it's the new art, and it's just sections 110 to 125. Incidentally, these section numbers are following the standard Latin edition produced by a French scholar, Veronese, who numbered it all the way through, and so we follow those numbers so you can easily look back and see what other people have said. Just to kind of go back to the Sworn Book of Honorius, which you mentioned, Dr. Skinner, you mentioned that there are more than 40 passages of entire prayers that are borrowed from from the Ars Notoria and included in the Sworn Book of Honorius. Can you just kind of talk about that and then also the fact that just like the Ars Notoria, which is fascinating, the Sworn Book of Honorius also relies on you not to go any further until you get a dream vision and approval by the angels. Can you just share about this? Yes. So first of all, the Sworn Book of Honorius, we're only talking about the first section because the second section is definitely Solomonic and it comes from somewhere else. But the first section is not Solomonic, and the first section is very close to the Ars Notoria. Now, Joseph Peterson has convincingly proved that the sworn book of Hanarius has taken the prayers from the Ars Notoria. So Ars Notoria was the first, uh, followed by the sworn book of Hanarius. And it's somewhat more than 40 sections. They actually copied 74, almost word for word. Nowadays, that kind of plagiarism would get you into trouble. But in those days, I think the, the, the question was not who wrote it first. The question was, does it work? And if it works, I'm going to borrow it. So that's what they've probably done. The, the Sworn Book of Hanarius is a, another interesting grimoire. It's not a very helpful name. 
you wonder who's swearing and what are they swearing about. It would have been better if the name had been translated as the Oath-Bound Book of Hanarius, because every time a magician leaves it in his will to somebody else or passes it to an apprentice, he has to extract quite a complicated oath from them. So the book is bound by that oath, which is the the reason for it being called the Sworn Book, as you have to swear before you get it. Joseph Peterson is the standard edition of that. But obviously this and ours and Toria have got a common ancestor somewhere, which we don't yet know, but um, one day somebody will figure it out. I hope it's sooner rather than later. Definitely. In fact, you and Daniel have a wonderful few paragraphs in the book where you describe that there is a very helpful hint in terms of, I believe, Euclid being the father of Honorius and how the Ars Notoria is, that's basically a hint saying the Ars Notoria is the father of the sworn book. Can you elaborate on that? You just said it all. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Euclid of Thebes, as, as you say, is the father of Honorius, and Honorius is the reputed author of the sworn book. So that's very clear that Ars Notoria came first and that the prayers are passed down to the sworn book. But uh, it doesn't answer the question as to, well, where do they come from in the first place? And the answer to that is probably Constantinople. And before that, if I had to guess, I would say Syria. Uh, of course, any traces of what the ancients did in Syria has been pretty systematically removed by uh, ISIS with its knocking down of various monuments. I believe they even destroyed Apollonius's grave. Apollonius's grave is very strange. It's not on the ground or in the ground, but it's three quarters of the way up a wall, which would normally stop it being damaged. But no, they, they got up there with sledgehammers and drills and they completely destroyed it. So the chances of finding any clues inside his coffin have blown away in the wind. Let's talk a little bit about John of Morigny and the Ars Notoria being used as kind of a base text of which there are modified versions or drastically changed versions. And it was such a pleasure to have Dr. Claire Fanger on the podcast. Uh, she's written extensively about this 14th century monk, John of Morigny. And as you and Daniel point out in the book, and as Dr. Fanger has pointed out, John of Morigny, this monk, found that using the Ars Notoria caused him to have terrifying demonic visions. And so he prepared an altered version of the Ars Notoria, which was also received the blessing of the Virgin Mary. Can you talk about the differences between the Ars Notoria and versus kind of John of Morigny's Book of the Flowers of the Heavenly Teaching. What should listeners know? The history is that John of Morigny first discovered the Ars Notoria in 1304, and he learned it and he practiced it and he taught his sister Bridget. But he found that he was getting a series of terrifying demonic visions from it. And so he later went and prayed to the Virgin Mary, who happened to have a chapel very close to where he was living. Under her instruction, he produced what he thought was a purified version. First of all, in 1311, so the first thing he did was remove all of the note. In other words, he took the engine out of the car, but he added a written description of each of the note which is interesting, but not nearly as good as actually having the, the diagrams themselves. And then four years later, in 1305, he issued a more purified version, where the only figures were half a dozen figures of the Virgin Mary and one of Jesus Christ. So the note had been completely stripped out of it by then. And he, as you rightly said, called it oh, the, Heavenly Flowers. The, the Book of the Flowers of the Heavenly Teaching. Yes, that's right, which actually is a title which he borrowed from Section 38 of the Ars Notoria, which is called The Flower of Heavenly Learning. So he, he was also a plagiarist. So he took the, the car, removed the engine, changed the title, and then proposed it to his other monkish friends, etc., that uh, this is a, a much better way of doing it. And it would get you beatific visions, which is a vision of the Virgin Mary and, and maybe of Christ. 
which of course was uh, something that monks hoped to achieve. Now, his version has attracted most of the commentary by academics. That's understandable because his version was much more Christian, actually fitted into the doctrines of that time, and was a much safer thing, didn't, didn't have anything that could be slightly demonic, although he did retain the magical words, which possibly had some demonic content, but we won't go into that. And then later, that particular book uh, was condemned by the council in Paris and publicly burned in the open square. But that's sort of fascinating. So the history of all that has been written by Dr. Uh, Claire Fanger, also Watson, I think. That can be read. But my fascination is with the engine, with the, the note. So you will no longer find that in the John and Meringi stuff. You've got to go back to the earlier copies before he started bowdlerizing it and cleaning it up. However, reading around, I came across a passage which describes how John was before he even came across the the Ars Notoria, and I think he was rather screwed up even then, because he writes, and I'm quoting, I lived in the lane of the Blessed Virgin Mary, very close to the church, about a stone's throw away. I think that was in Chartres. And he said, On a certain night I was placed in a kind of ecstasy, whether in the body or out of the body, I know not. So he was thinking, Am I astral projected or am I still in the body? He says, But God knows. And lo, I saw a certain horrible figure. And it seemed to me absolutely certain that it was the enemy of the human race. Well, anybody in the Middle Ages would know that we're talking about the devil here. And that figure rose up against me, wishing and craving to suffocate me. And when I saw it, I fled aghast in great fear from its terrible face. And it pursued me hither and thither, and could not catch me, and yet pressed upon me as it followed, so that I left the house I was in, fleeing from the face of my persecutor. And then to abbreviate the rest, he rushed into the local church, went down on his knees in front of the image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she protected him. So this is long before he came across the Ars Notoria, so it rather destroys the argument that the Ars Notoria caused him uh, horrible dreams. He was obviously not a little disturbed even before, and even after he had purified the Ars Notoria, he still had the same dreams. I think these days he would have been a candidate not for the monastery, but maybe for the asylum. But we'll leave that alone, uh, because he did actually create several more copies of his Book of Flowers of Heavenly Doctrine, uh, which has fascinated a lot of people. But it's a dumbing down of the Ars Notoria. It's not not an improvement, it's not an advance, it's a backward-looking work. So that's so much for John and Moringi. To that point, Dr. Skinner, as well, we have a question from Damian Gordon, who is asking, in the Glitch Bottle podcast interview with Dr. Claire Fanger, she spoke about John Amoringi just freaking out about the names of demons having gotten into the Ars Notoria. And the question is, does Dr. Skinner agree with this assessment by the monk that the Ars Notoria includes the names of demons? And if so, does Dr. Skinner regard this as a corruption of the text from a more pure, correct form like John did, or perhaps as intrinsic? to the method. And, and I'll just add to that quickly, Dr. Skinner, is that yourself and Daniel write in the book a lot about the verba ignota, the, the, these kind of specific words that look very confusing to someone who, say, only speaks English. Um, can you just talk about these verba ignota and what they mean and the significance? Sure. So first of all, to stand back, the Arsentoria's method has got three parts. One is the prayers to the angels which um, is why librarians quite often just catalog this as a prayer book. And these are the sort of things you would find in many other prayer books. The second part are the the unknown words, the verba ignota, and these are the interesting ones. And then the third part is the note, which are the illustrations. So the verba ignota are, I am sure, a mixture of Hebrew and Greek. So, for example, you'll find things like goza miel, so it ends in I-E-L. That's a, that's a dead giveaway. It's um, a typical Hebrew ending to a, an angel name. There's a number of angels in this list of names. 
but there are also a lot of Greek words, words ending in M-A-I, meaning that they are verbs. And so you've got a mixture of angel names and Greek verbs. Disappointed to say that I have not been able to translate this, but we're working on it. This batch of names definitely includes some angelic names and some demonic names, and I think it's intrinsic to the method. Now, they're, they're just listed with commas between, so I think it's really like calling on all of these entities, come and help me digest this subject. Come and give me better memory. Come and give me the subject matter. Now, now, quickly, quickly. Those words are not there, but I think that's the intention. Fortunately, John and Marenghi didn't strip these out. He left them in because I think he's smart enough to know that they were intrinsic to the method. So I don't think it's evil demon names that have been crept into the text at a later date. I think it's part of the method. In the book itself, yourself and Daniel mentioned that there will be a likely follow-up to this. And to that point, the full version of the Ars Notoria was published in, in Latin with glosses and the images of the note by, as you mentioned, um, Julien Veronese, and that was in 2007. And as you know, most of the actual instructions for practice are in the glosses. And Veronese also notes this in his article in the Invoking Angels book. And you say that you plan to publish a new translation of the practical instruction from the version B. Can you share more information about what's contained in, in the glosses? So, first of all, Veronese has done the more, the standard, the almost standard Latin version of the of a full French text. And that French text has version A, which is the original Ars Notoria from the early 1200s. It has a version B, which is a commentary on A, and it has an opus operam as well. Now, the translation in the book we just published, Daniel and I, is enough to use the system. But there's lots of nagging little questions which are answered in the the later commentaries. By the way, Veronese published a few of the illustrations at the back that are commonly available. So his is not a usable work. If you look at the title page of the book we've just produced, it says Ars Notoria, Grimoire of Rapid Learning by Magic with the Golden Flowers of Apollonius of Tyana. And then in slightly smaller letters, it says Volume 1 dash Version A. So Volume 2, which I'm working on with another colleague, will have Version B in the Opus Opera, and it'll have the complete Latin text with the Latin commentaries, with the additional stuff, all translated into English. Plus, there will be like a curriculum for doing the work so that you, you don't have to read your way around Turner too many times to find out what you're supposed to be doing. So we got this far, uh, which is already more than 400 pages, so we thought we'll just publish this now so that the text is the basic text, version A is available, and the note A is available. And this is not an advert for the volume 2 version B, but you should be aware that if you really want to dive into this practice, you're going to need the second volume. So that would probably produce a few groans, but there's enough information in version A. That is the original system. That is the text that was there in the early 13th century. I really want to get into that because what I love about this presentation that yourself and, and Daniel have released is I love how you both match the specific note two specific passages, whereas if you were just reading Turner, let's say, you know, from the 1600s translation, you wouldn't really, okay, what note is that, or what nota is that, and where does this go? So I oh, love how you lay that out. Exactly, and and Turner was a bit naughty. His, his Latin translation is pretty good, but he cut out things like indication as to which note we're talking about. He cut out positional stuff and so forth, so what we did was, in the text, we put thumbnails of the appropriate note in pretty close to the right position. So when you're working through it, you come across, here begins the special precepts of the note of theology. In Turner, there's nothing then. It just goes on and keeps talking. So I put in three thumbnails so you know which uh, note we're talking about. So that makes it much more um, usable as well as that 
actually unscrewing up the order that Turner did it in, which I can tell you was a lot of work, makes it much more logical and easier to read. Dr. Skinner, to that point, I have four questions from Glitch Bottle patrons and supporters specifically asking about your results. So I'll just read them all here since they're related. A question from the Odd Lifter is asking, I'd like to hear about Dr. Skinner's personal experience with this book. Has he worked the system and found results? And if so, could he elaborate on those results? A question from Curtis, who's asking, have you ever had the chance to use the note alongside the prayers and orations yet in practice and to please share an experience? Curtis is also asking, in contrast to other works in the Lamegaton, with the note included, how would you compare the results from using the Arsenatoria? And Etch is asking, if Dr. Skinner used the procedures in the Arsenatoria, was Dr. Skinner able to improve his memory and his ability to understand subject matter, resulting in absorbing material more quickly. So with that, Dr. Skinner, can you share with the listeners a little bit about your early results using the Arsenatoria? Yeah, first of all, I wouldn't have done this if I wasn't intending to use it. And that, that's always been my objectives. Just uh, being an armchair magician has no particular attraction. So that was the plan. Now, once I'd got most of this organized, I realized that because I'm not a medieval monk, I needed the commentary that uh, appears in version B to before I can do it properly. So I'm deferring doing it properly until that translation is complete, which I'm working on with another colleague. So that's my cop out. But I did a few little experiments. So like I worked on the grammar section and I had a noticeable improvement in my ability to parse Latin, which is a personal pleasure for me. Now, I haven't actually quantified that, but I can tell you that it's considerably better after working on that. So that encouraged me. So then I thought I'd do a few objective things. So, as you know, I live in Asia. So I have one friend who is brought up in an Asian context, has never even heard of Latin, doesn't know what Latin is, speaks English and speaks a few Asian languages. But the idea of uh, medieval Latin or monastic existence does not compute. So I showed her some of the note and then subvocally read out the, the prayers, not with any uh, apparent intention and got her to identify one or two of the note. Then she started looking at the Latin text, and she's going, ha, huh, this one is here, that one is there. And she started vocalizing the Latin, which really quite surprised me. She got stuck into it. So I have a semi-experimental proof that at least the, the Latin part works. There was a couple of examples in the book of people testing the Ars Notoria on unsuspecting and unlearned village folk, and that's the sort of thing I wanted to duplicate. That's not what we would all hope for, but after the Part B is translated fully and I've worked it into a syllabus and a tight list of um, what to do and when to do it, then I'm going to sit down and devert four months to it and do it properly, and I'll let you know then what you and Daniel present in this tome specifically is definitely more than enough to get started. And it is, it is so rejuvenating because you also include not one, but five full versions of the note, which are just enigmatic and gorgeous to contemplate in and of themselves. And we have another question to that point from the odd lifter who says, does Dr. Skinner have a favorite of the five versions of the note that are presented in the book? Uh -huh. That's a hard one. So the five versions presented, first of all, the, the Yale 1225. And because that's the first I came across, I'm quite fond of that. And I actually went to the Vanecki Library in Yale and was able to actually work my way through that manuscript, which is surprisingly very small. When we blew it up for the book, in fact, I blew it up very much larger, half desk size, so, to enable me to be able to read it properly. So that one I'm fond of. The second one, the Sloan manuscript, Sloan 1712, 
is very similar to the Yale manuscript and follows the same sort of order. So that is sort of confirmatory. The CLM 276, which is uh, from the Stats Bibliotheque, that is completely different. And it's drawn in a very modern way. I'm looking at some of these, these diagrams, and you could imagine a graphic artist producing them. And for a little while, I even doubted the age of the manuscript, but no, it definitely is as old as it claims to be. It claims to be 1350. So I chose manuscripts which were two in the 1200s, one 1350, and then later and later. So you can see the development from one to the other. The German Staatsbibliothek CLM manuscript is like precision engineering drawings. It's not like talismanic drawings, which are quite often sometimes rough. Somebody has sat down with a ruler and a fine point, well, I was going to say a fine point pen, but it was probably a fine point quill, and done the most beautiful work. Even the curves are, are beautifully done. That one is also a favorite, and I realize I'm copying out by not picking a particular favorite. And then the French one. Bibliothèque Nationale 9336, which is actually version B, which is where most of the translations work is going at the moment, is very detailed. It has more, more explanation in it and so forth. But it's still effectively the same batch of note. There will be variations, but nobody is going suddenly, oh, we must do a note for computer engineering or something. People are sticking very closely, even over hundreds of years, to the original forms. And then finally, we come to my real favorite, which is a manuscript done by Simon Foreman in the year 1600, and it is effectively version B. And it is, strangely enough, kept in the National Library of Israel because the guy who bought it at auction in London bequeathed his stuff there. And it is very beautiful. All the gold work on it is real gold leaf. The writing is a little bit ratty in places, but very readable. And there's an occasional English comment in there, but otherwise it's solid Latin. It is just very beautiful. So, yes, that's very hard to say which is my favorite. Of the 110 manuscripts, we picked the ones that are A, the most instructive, B, the most beautiful, and C, spread out over the centuries so that you can see the development. I'm looking through it as you're going, kind of following along in the book, and uh, it, it is really tough to choose a version. Although, just to follow up on that, Dr. Skinner, I know that yourself and, and Daniel mentioned that if someone is getting the book and they want to really get into it initially, the important thing I believe you and Daniel mention, if I'm remembering correctly, is to pick a version of the note and stick with it and, and try and use that system. Would that be yeah. somewhat fair? Absolutely. It's the same sort of general rule which you'd apply to, to working with Solomonic grimoires. There's no good re reason for chopping and changing. If you've got a fairly complete one, you might add in one or two elements from another grimoire, but you stick with that particular register of spirits. You stick with those particular talismans or in this case, you stick with that set of note. Also, to that point, Dr. Skinner, I'd love to talk about the figure of memory, which you list in the book. And I think this really speaks to the, the amount of legwork, the amount of rigor, and actually examining these manuscripts that yourself and Daniel really show. And just to kind of set this up, you mentioned that both the Latin edition in Agrippa's opera Omnia and Turner's translation include a simple but rather enigmatic diagram. And it is the, uh, the figure of memory. And it looks like almost pieces are missing, and then can you talk about what is the figure of memory, and then talk about how you and Daniel came across BPH-242? Yes. The figure is actually like a double cross inside of a circle, with four equal arm crosses at the end, and just one single line saying the crown of Michael in Latin. And so we thought, what is this? Is this is this meant to be worn on the head? Is it a protection? Is it a phylactery? And then, of course, I realized, so well, I'm just thinking like it's a Solomonic text again. So it's none of these things. We just reproduced it and left it at that. 
But Daniel didn't stop looking, and he found a, another version of the Ars Notoria, a sort of slightly shorter one, and in it there's a figura memoria, or memoriae, and it is a beautiful color rendition of this with a stylized Hebrew mem in the, in the middle, mem standing for Michael, Latin around the outside, again talking about the crown of Michael, and then some explanation as to what it's actually used for. But without having found that, we just think, oh, well, it's a circle with a cross in the middle, but it's a lot more than that. And the collection we found it in is in Amsterdam, and it was the collection that was put together in what they call now the Embassy of the Free Mind, but which was previously the Rittman Collection, which is one of the, the best collections of alchemic, hermetic, and magic manuscripts. Sadly, at one stage, they had the oldest clavicular salamonis, and for financial reasons, they were obliged to sell it, so that's now in private hands. I would dearly like to have seen that before it went. But the other side of that coin is that Dan Brown, the famous and very rich novelist, came to the, the rescue by providing the funds to film and digitize many of the manuscripts in this collection. So suddenly you don't have to go to Amsterdam anymore. They're online and they're free, and that's thanks to Dan Brown, a case of an author actually putting his money and his mouth you know, in the same place as he got his inspiration from in the first place. So full marks to him. Daniel found it there, and so we've re reproduced it in the book with a, a bit of a commentary on what it actually does, which I, I won't go into now. There's a question from Frater Ashen Chassan about the Ars Notoria, and I think it's a question that's on a lot of people's minds, which is, what does Dr. Skinner consider the largest benefit this edition of the Ars Notoria will be for magical practitioners? And if I could just add on that, I think there's a lot of people who say, my goodness, I, I, you know, I read all of Dr. Skinner's books. I, I practice grimoireic magic, Solomonic magic. How do I integrate the Ars Notoria? What should I take away from this as a Solomonic grimoireic traditionalist, for example? Okay, so as we've already established, it's not really traditional Solomonic magic. It is in a class of its own. But what to take away from it? Well, first of all, let me just go right back. A lot of people think that magic is spiritual. Now, however you define spiritual, whether you define it as dealing with spirits or improving the quality of your soul, it is certainly not meant to improve the quality of your soul. It is meant to command spirits and angels to produce physical and real changes in your life and the surroundings, which is why it's magic. It does things that you can't do with a pickaxe or a crossbow or whatever else. It will make changes in the physical world. This one is unique because it makes changes in your own memory by adding subjects to your memory and giving you a much more flexible and absorptional memory, which is amazing in its own right. So it's the only piece of magic that does that. There are some spirits in the Goetia which will give you mastery on certain subjects. And at some stage, I want to try and see where the parallels are and make some connections. But at the moment, the Ars Notoria is solely focused on giving you concrete benefits, a knowledge of uh, mathematics, a knowledge of medicine, a knowledge of law, there and then inside of four months. So that is, that is truly magic. The largest benefit is not a magical benefit, it's a memory and personal knowledge benefit. So if you were solely applying it to magic, then you would just use it to absorb spirit registers and to be able to memorize long conjurations without holding a script in front of you, which you really should never do. Magic has got to be, you've got to proclaim it extempore. Even if you make a mistake or you have to fudge it a little bit, it's much better than, than holding a candle and a shaky piece of paper and trying to read from it. Spirits will know you're an amateur. So the benefit is memory. That sounds like something I know every single one of us could use for sure. I, I don't think there's a, a limit to augmenting one's memory for sure. Is there anything else that, that we haven't touched on that you want listeners to know about? Or is there anything else that, that we can stay tuned for? Okay, can I just do a little bit about practicalities? 
though the book is printed, copies are only immediately available from Golden Horde in Singapore because the, the bulk of the copies are sitting in a container ship making its way across the Pacific Ocean to America and another one in the reverse direction to the UK. So it will be another four to six weeks before the book is actually available in the US or the, the UK. So that's the practical thing. One of the things that we can talk about perhaps some other time are the short biographies in there of rather fascinating people like Simon Foreman, Apollonius, how his talismans work and things like that. Otherwise, can I give a quick plug to say that the second edition of John Dee's Spiritual Diaries is also in the same position. It's printed, it's available from Singapore, and in six weeks' time to be available in America. This is 844 pages long, and the advantage of this one is that finally the Latin is integrated. Previously, I wanted to keep the Kasorbon's text unpolluted by translation, but now the, everything in Latin is translated into English in this book, so you can read it cover to cover without knowing a word of Latin. 844 pages, but much easier to deal with. I, I should mention, in the book, in, in the Ars Notoria, you and, and Daniel really provide just a fascinating history of the owners of these books, but also, like, I'm reading about, you know, scandals and, you know, affairs and intrigue and being imprisoned in the Tower of London and alchemists. I mean, it's just a fascinating history of some of the owners of these books. Even old Sloan, Hans Sloan. Yes. Introduced milk chocolate to English afternoon tea. And yeah, he became very rich and so on. That's a bit of fun. A lot of that's Daniel's work, actually. I can't claim full credit for that, but we can talk about that some other time. Absolutely, and much thanks to Daniel and much thanks to yourself. And Dr. Skinner, just thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the podcast to talk about the Ars Notoria today. Oh, my pleasure. It's always good to talk to you. And then thanks for your classic piece of Latin reading. <laughs> oh, listeners, what a rejuvenating insight into the Ars Notoria, and I hope you enjoyed this chat with Dr. Stephen Skinner as much as I did. I have to say, seeing the note side by side with the corrections to Turner's text really illuminated to me how to actually go about using the system itself. Also, in the 21st century, the rapid acquisition of information is vital, of course, and having a solid grounding in rhetoric and grammar and logic and many other vital building blocks of education is definitely something that has everlasting value. Glitch Bottle patrons and supporters can also enjoy exclusive content and monthly benefits and a huge thanks of support to each and every one of you Glitch Bottle patrons, because as monthly supporters, you are the driving force in fueling the show in new and interesting ways. And if you'd like to jump on the Glitch Bottle caravan with us, visit patreon.com slash glitch bottle to find out more. As always, you can subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube and listen on Spotify, Spreaker.com, Stitcher Radio, and iTunes. And if you enjoy the show, leaving a review on iTunes is always most welcome. I am so honored for the support of each and every Glitch Bottle patron, and more great guests and new content is right around the esoteric corner. And as always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. <laughs> <laughs>